Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Savage with the Maine Natural Guard, and I appreciate Peace Action Maine inviting me here uh, with the Reverend Richard Kilmer this evening to do a kind of a reflection on COP26, which just uh, concluded. And um, uh, I was participating in COP26, but uh, virtually. I did not travel to Glasgow. Um, I would note that I'm on the Wabanaki homeland here in Solon, Maine, where I live. My, one of my closest year-round neighbors is Barry Dana, the former chief of the Penobscot Nation, a member of the Wabanaki Alliance. And his point of view about climate conferences that everyone flies to <clears throat> internationally is that that is a, a ridiculous approach to addressing climate crisis and that any that people who do so uh, really don't deserve the title of you know uh, environmentalists. Many indigenous people, not only Wabanaki indigenous people, but from around the world do gather at these um, climate conferences and um, exchange information and meet with each other and form alliances and so forth. Uh, but Barry's point about the um, <clears throat> carbon impact of all that travel is uh, perhaps well taken. Um, I was uh, invited to participate in the virtual uh, People's Summit of the COP26 coalition. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, what we learned in that presentation and also um, some steps forward or some action items that you might consider doing. Um, before I share my slides with you, I wanted to point out that um, we are very blessed in Maine to have many talented visual artists who help us bring issues to people in a way that's um, accessible and um, understandable, not as wordy. And um, I'm not against words. I'm kind of a word person, a writer myself. However, um, I to, this evening I've got a, a work by, this is a print by my friend Kenny Cole, an artist who's having a show right now in Maine. He's a really thoughtful artist. This, this um, print of his is called Last Run. And I don't know if you can see it well enough, but it's an iceberg that presumably is melting. And there's a lot of black smoke representing carbon output in the background. And there's a skier, a recreational skier, you know, slaloming down the uh, iceberg. But there's a military tank, uh, uh, you know, on, on, the, on the lower level of the iceberg going around. And Kenny made this years ago. Is it dated? Uh, I don't think it is dated, but um, I, I bought this from him many years ago. And he said that he made this in response to people who um, don't want to think about climate crisis or militarization um, or the connection between the two because it's too upsetting. And they would rather just ski and get together with their friends and talk about um, their, you know, the fun that they can have living um, in a climate where you can do that. So I'm not against fun and I'm not against getting together with friends, but I do have a real commitment to looking at the hard and, and uncomfortable truths of our uh, so this stage at late stage capitalism and where we are with um, expecting can the next seven generations that the, um, you know, the Wabanaki always said we made decisions based on um, how it would affect the next seven generations. Can the next seven generations sustain life on this planet at the rate we're going? Uh, I think the answer clearly is no, not at the rate we're going. So we're going to have to make some pretty radical changes. Um, I'm going to start sharing my slides now, and I hope it works for you. Martha and I practiced this, but of course, as soon as you're presenting the technology, it goes awry. There we are. You see it? Okay, Loading. great. Thank you. This so is this is the title slide of the presentation that I was a part of. And um, the topic of US militarism, and then also, US space technology and how those impact climate crisis were not joined at the hip to begin with. Actually, Veterans for Peace, both in the US and the UK, made a proposal to talk about US militarism and climate crisis. That organization has done a lot of work on this topic and I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, in the meantime, our friend here in Maine, Bruce Gagnon, who is a, a organizer with the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, made a, a proposal to do a session on space technology and how that impacts climate. 
And the People's Summit for Climate Justice um, was uh, organized in part by the Institute for Policy Studies, a progressive think tank in Washington, DC that many of you may be aware of. And they asked uh, Veterans for Peace and the Global Network if they would consider merging their two presentations because the topics were somewhat similar. Um, so those organizations agreed to do that. And um, I agreed to speak on behalf of the Global Network um, in, in this uh, presentation. Um, you can see that I've included a graphic by another artist who uh, created the Pentagon planet il uh, illustration. It's very professionally done. Certainly I couldn't make anything like that. Uh, Anthony Freda made this graphic for me some years back when I was looking for uh, graphics that would be helpful for conveying that the Pentagon is the biggest institutional polluter on the planet in terms of fossil fuel consumption. It consumes more fossil fuel than uh, 100. If it were listed with nations, there would be 140 nations below it on the list in terms of um, how much fossil fuel they consume. And so Anthony Freda made this graphic for me. It's called Pentagon Planet. And he is happy to uh, have people use it for communicating about these topics. So um, if you would like a copy of that graphic or would like to use it, please get in touch with me. Um, the COP26 coalition did a lot of organizing for on the ground. Um, the People's Summit had more than 100 in-person sessions in several languages. And um, so uh, I'm sure that many of you probably saw some videos of some of those, um, some of that happening in Glasgow. And then there were more than 70 of these digital sessions over the course of five days, I believe it was. And um, as I mentioned, the Global Network and Veterans for Peace, and then also uh, IPS, which uh, has an offshoot or one of its projects is the National Priorities Project, which crunches the numbers of the federal budget in a very useful way for us activists. Um, so we had folks from all three of those organizations working together to create um, this presentation that you see here on the list. One of the challenges was um, one of the presenters for Global Network was in Hawaii. One of the presenters for Veterans for Peace United Kingdom was in Glasgow and the rest of us were scattered around North America. So it was tricky for them to find a time when we would all be awake and coherent that we could uh, present. So the presenters, uh, there were several people helping to organize this session, but the the actual presenters were Adrienne Kinney of VFP US. She is the um, uh, executive, or she's the president of Veterans for Peace right now. And they have a very good website that I've linked to here, Climate Crisis and Militarism. They've been working on this topic um, diligently for a couple of years. They have many great resources there. And I urge you to check that out if you have not seen it before. Um, David Collins was on the ground there in Glasgow. Um, reporting on the British side of things. We had Ashik Sadiq from uh, Institute for Policy Studies with us to talk about the federal budget and how what resources uh, go toward uh, militarism versus uh, climate, you know, addressing climate crisis. Uh, Kuhan Pakmander talked mostly about the oceans and the war in the Pacific, so-called smart ocean that is being um, uh, filled with 5G type sonar devices and very, very destructive to um, marine life, which she pointed out whales in particular sequester an immense amount of carbon and um, their continued good health is key for the rest of us. And then my presentation uh, focused um, more on space technology, rocket launches, NASA, private space endeavors and what kind of impacts uh, those have on climate. I've embedded the video here. I'm not going to play it because it's over an hour, but um, I did share the link to the slides in the chat of this webinar. And I think that Martha will also send you that link in a follow-up email. So if you didn't see this presentation, you may want to consider watching it um, on YouTube. Uh, you can watch it in its entirety or um, the Global Network um, um, 
usefully broke out Kuhan's presentation, which is about 14 minutes long. I made a standalone video of it. And there again, you can watch it in, embedded in my slides or use the link to go to uh, YouTube and watch it. And then they did the same um, with my presentation, my part of the presentation also about 13, 14 minutes long. I am uh, always interested in information management. I think that the reason that most uh, people in the US don't know about the huge climate impacts of our military and of our space programs is because corporate media, the mainstream media, make sure that we don't ever know about it. Um, and one of the things that I uh, shared was, you know, the power of propaganda is not uh, really purveying false facts. It's really creating a tiny, tiny little peephole and telling people look, everything, you know, everything you need to see and pay attention to is in, in that peephole. Everything that exists outside that peephole, it's insignificant or it's false. Don't pay any attention to it. And this is the strategy that has been pursued about the Pentagon's impact on climate and also uh, space programs impact on climate. So um, those two are parallel in that way of managing the information about them. Um, one of the things that I uh, found in doing the research for my presentation was that if you try to use search engines to find information about the climate impacts of the military, uh, you cannot find that information using various different search engines. What you'll find instead is plenty of articles and um, speeches by Pentagon officials or reporters for the defense industries or um, you know, reporters that talk to, to the generals and admirals. And what they'll say is, oh, we are aware that climate crisis is a very grave threat to security. We will be ramping up our you know, fortification of the border so that climate refugees don't overwhelm us. We are already addressing the uh, impact of rising sea levels on our military um, outposts around the world, and we are aware of it, and we are, you know, working hard to mitigate the effects of climate change. Never do they admit in any way, shape, or form that they are major contributors to climate crisis, that, they're, that the carbon output of Pentagon and its contractors is immense. And another reason, another very effective um, strategy for information control is that during the COP, um, which took place in Kyoto in the 90s, the US insisted that military emissions not be included in the uh, count for a nation. So the US uh, military, whatever, or whatever the carbon footprint was for the US, it would not include the military. And they got that concession at the um, meeting of the parties there, but then failed to sign the, the Kyoto Protocols in the end anyway. Um, but that has had a lasting effect. The, the Paris Accords made reporting your military missions or including them in your nation's you know, total optional. And the US still, of course, has failed to do so. One of the things I learned while working on this presentation is that actually the last National Defense Authorization Act, which is an omnibus bill that funds the Pentagon each year and also, you know, everybody throws in anything they, they think they can wedge in there, did in fact pass with the provision in it that the military be required to monitor and report its emissions. So that is huge, except that they're still not doing it. And without enforcement, things like that are kind of, you know, empty rhetoric. But um, I'll talk about a, an action that we can take to try to perhaps move that forward. Um, it's academics that we mostly rely on for this uh, kind of information. The Pentagon is not going to tell us. Um, but uh, we are very lucky to have um, Dr. Nita Crawford working with the Costs of War Project uh, at the Watson Institute at Brown University because she uh, in 2019 reported out on her research about, well, how much has the global war on terror um, emitted, you know, the, for just on the US side? How, what are the emissions for that? And um, Peace Action Maine had her as a guest speaker a couple years ago or right before the pandemic, I guess it was. And I was lucky enough to hear her speak about her research. And one of the things that she told us was, well, you can't find any data to study about emissions 
from the military, but what you can find is data on fossil fuel consumption. So I used that data and then, you know, applied some, uh, some things that we know about how much emissions that would produce. And one of the things the Cost of War Project is very good at doing is not only the research, but then converting the findings into sort of user-friendly um, consume, you know, the, the, a lay person could understand the, the reports that are published on that uh, website. And, and they even created, uh, they had created this great infographic um, not just giving the total of the 1.2 billion metric tons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the war on terror, but also, you know, creating, a, um, scaling it to something that most people can relate to and know a little bit more about, such as driving a car. So um, anytime uh, I run across these kind of communication uh, vehicles that people can, you know, really get a grasp on uh, some of this information, I try to put them on my main natural guard website, share them there and provide links so that others can find them and, and use them as well. Um, part of what I learned uh, from doing the presentation for the COP26 uh, People's Summit was that there's very little research on space programs impacts on climate, uh, at least that I could find. I'm not an academic, I'm a retired school teacher and I don't have access to those kind of journals, peer-reviewed scientific journals that such research would typically be reported in. I kind of rely on uh, journalists to report out on research that is of significance. And sometimes they do, but um, I did uh, manage to find some information from a research group out of the University College of London that was working with uh, people from a couple other universities, including MIT in the US to track the emissions uh, produced by rocket launches. And this did not distinguish between whether they were um, uh, military rocket launches or, uh, you know, um, NASA, which pretends to not be a military program, but clearly is, or private, you know, these, these billionaire celebrities that everyone either loves to love or loves to hate um, rocket launches. But it did uh, distinguish between what kind of fuel was being used, which of course has a lot of impact on emissions. And um, so this is a chart that I found from that group. And the US as usual is in the lead. Um, one area where there has been more research on space programs is the impact of rocket launches on ozone depletion. Um, again, you will, if you try to search for information on this, you are likely to find headlines like this, that NASA is a friend of the earth. It is launching satellites to help track the health of our planet. And again, there will be no reference to the climate impact of NASA launching satellites um, or the climate impact of space debris, satellites that have um, outlived their usefulness falling back into the atmosphere and burning up that also um, burns a lot of uh, electronics and plastics and, and um, is, is harmful to climate. And there's a, there's a little bit more research about that. Um, one of the things that I haven't paid a ton of attention to in the past, but I did when in researching my um, presentation was, you know, um, NASA is never portrayed as a military program, but in fact, any technology developed by NASA is used by the military. And um, the PR campaigns aimed at very young children. As a school teacher, I was familiar with the fact that, um, you know, there's very aggressive marketing of space programs. Oh, they're so fantastic. They're, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a new field, it's exploration and so forth. And you can see this, you know, example of um, cutesy uh, ad, ad, advertiser publicity aimed at kids and very much like military recruiting ads, they're going to lean heavily on identity politics. They're going to make sure there's lots of women, and people of color um, uh, in, you know, in these kind of communications for the public. One of the things that I've been doing that I hope is useful to people is the Maine Natural Guard is a um, organization I founded. It's actually a very simple uh, organization. You, you don't have to pay dues or even really join it, but um, I suggest taking a pledge to connect the dots between militarism and climate crisis. So when people are talking about security 
point out that climate is the biggest threat to our security. And when people are talking about climate, point out that the military is a huge contributor to climate crisis. Uh, one of the things that I do, as I mentioned, is collect articles and so forth. And so in the last year or two, uh, there's been a lot of momentum around this subject. And in my opinion, that is probably the best thing that came out of COP26. There was an enormous amount of interest, maybe not at the official podium, um, because the US and the other countries don't want you to be counting your military's emissions, but the um, People's Summit and, the, uh, and, and others were actually much more focused on that, much more interested in finding information about it and, and pointing out this sort of carbon belching um, elephant in the room. So this, these are just a couple of my most recent posts on my, I've linked here to the resources page of my main Natural Guard website. And what I do when I find one is um, put a link to it and when it was published and by who and, and who authored it. Um, we're starting to get podcasts now. So that's, that's good. Lots of people don't like to read articles nearly as much as they like to um, listen to a discussion about it. And um, so uh, that to me is very encouraging that internationally scholars are taking more of an interest, journalists are taking more of an interest, and uh, you know the information is out there if you care to find it. Um, other organizations that are working on this um, that also joined in on COP26 in various ways, World Beyond War, um, they did a good webinar um, recently. I think with Doug Weir, who we saw as one of the authors, uh, one of the researchers here in the um, in this link. But um, again, this is a good um, way of creating a you know what a meme. Very few words, some pictures, and a quick fact that helps people kind of um, you know put it in a scale that they can kind of understand. Um, so that's really useful. This is a visual that was created. Um, in co collaboration with Peace Action Maine, Maine Natural Guard, and um, Global Network here in Maine for some of our work at Bath Ironworks calling for conversion of that military industrial plant to building solutions to, or at least things that mitigate climate change rather than contributing to it. And these posters were um, printed up for uh, some events that we had this summer. And um, so again, helping people understand how to connect, that these dots are connected is, is part of you know, what I, I do. This is my final slide. I thought I'd show you how long we've been putting uh, nuclear reactors and nuclear um, items in space. In the news just this today or this week, we saw that NASA has asked private companies to help them plan how to put a nuclear reactor on the moon. And um, if you're like me, you're thinking, oh, gee, what could go wrong with shooting, building a nuclear reactor on Earth and shooting it into space to put it on the moon? But this is an ad I found from 1962. Martin Marietta kind of, you know, uh, beating their chest and bragging about this, their great nuclear reactor, nuclear generator in space. Um, that was became obsolete by mid 1966. Is it still out there as space junk? I don't know the answer to that, but um, it might be. So there's lots of um, other things we could say about militarism and climate, but I think that I've talked enough for tonight. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides. And I'll again remind you that I put a link to my slides in the chat and um, Martha will also mail it out to people with the uh, recording. So if you wanted to check out any of the resources that I talked about, many of them are linked in there. Thank you.